In 1907, a professor of chemistry at Tokyo Imperial University by the name of Kakuni Akita sat down to dinner and noticed that his broth was particularly delicious. A year later, on July 25, 1908, he figured out why. The compound that Professor Akita had identified today represents a nearly $7 billion industry with one of the most common, if most controversial, food additives. The complex history of the sodium salt of gluconic acid that is called monosodium glutamate deserves to be remembered. A July 2005 issue of The Guardian describes the simple origin of a complex compound. Professor Kakuni Aikida comes home from the physics faculty at the Tokyo Imperial University and sits down to eat a broth of vegetables and tofu prepared by his wife. It is, as usual, delicious. The professor, a mild bespectacled biochemistry specialist, turns to Mrs. Aikida and asks, as spouses occasionally will, what is the secret of her wonderful soup? Born in 1864, Aikida had studied chemistry at the School of Science at Imperial University Tokyo, graduating in 1889. He taught chemistry for a decade, and should becoming an associate professor at Imperial University before studying abroad, spending two years studying at the University of Leipzig in the laboratory of Friedrich Ostwald, considered one of the founders of the field of physical chemistry, and then several months more studying in the United Kingdom. It was this experience abroad that may have sparked his interest in his wife's soup. Japan's Umami Information Center explains, Akita was surprised at the physical size and nutritional conditions of German people at the time, and he developed a strong desire to improve the nutritional status of Japanese people back home. He also tried tomatoes, asparagus, meat, and cheese for the first time while in Germany. And through these experiences, he sensed that another basic taste was present in food, aside from the four currently recognized tastes of sweetness, sourness, saltiness, and bitterness. The secret of his wife's soup, it seems, were dried strips of Laminaria japonica, brown seaweed, commonly called kombu, a central ingredient in dashi, the soup stock used commonly in Japanese cuisine. The Guardian writes, Mrs. Akita's kombu is to lead him to a discovery that will make his fortune and change the nature of 20th century food. The Umami Information Center concludes, Upon sampling the kelp, he noticed that the same unique taste it discovered in the tomatoes, asparagus, meat, and cheese he had eaten in Germany was unmistakably present in the kelp dashi as well. Based on this realization, he began to research the constituents present in kelp. Smithsonian Magazine explained in 2013 that Aikida then took the seaweed and ran it through a series of chemical experiments using evaporation to isolate a specific compound within the seaweed. After days of evaporating and treating the seaweed, he saw the development of a crystalline form. The crystals Akita had discovered were, according to a November 8, 2013 edition of Smithsonian Magazine, the molecular formula C5H9NO4, the same as glutamic acid, an amino acid designated as non-essential because the human body, as well as a large smattering of other plants and animals, is able to produce it on its own. Food historian Dr. Ian Mosby writes, What Akita discovered was that when added to certain foods, glutamate often enhanced their inherent savory qualities. This was, in essence, the culinary function typically performed by foods naturally high in glutamate, such as sharp cheese, tomatoes, mushrooms, or seaweed. But Akita had done more than discover an additive. He believed that he had discovered a new taste. The Umami Information Center explains, since ancient times, common beliefs held that there were four basic tastes, sweetness, saltiness, sourness, and bitterness, and that any other taste encountered were the result of mixing combinations of these four. However, Aikida found that the taste he encountered in the kelp dashi was different than any of the established four, and was confident that he had discovered a fifth basic taste. He called this new taste umami. The culinary website The Spruce Eats explains that umami translates to pleasant, savory taste, has been described as brothy or meaty. You can taste umami in foods that contain a high level of the amino acid glutamate, like Parmesan cheese, seaweed, miso, and mushrooms. Umami has been described as having a mild but lasting aftertaste associated with salivation and a sensation of furriness on the tongue, stimulating the throat, the roof, and the back of the mouth. And in what may be a surprise to you, the spruce eats notes, breast milk is high in the amino acids that deliver the taste of umami which may prime a person to seek out this flavor profile throughout life. 
Well, a key to coin the term in 1908, Dr. Lindman notes that the scientific community received the discovery with moderate applause only. Many, especially in the English-speaking countries, remained unconvinced. In fact, the Society for Research on Umami Taste notes that the term umami did not receive international recognition until a symposium the Society held in 1985 after the discovery of umami taste receptors. But Aikido was not the first to have at least guessed at the existence of this fifth taste. The website of food manufacturer Ajinomoto notes that the ancient fermented fish sauce called garum was used widely throughout Rome in the ancient world. Garum is one of the first known examples of an umami-dominated condiment. And French gastronomist Jean Enthelm Briat Savarin posited a meaty taste that he called osmosome in his 1825 culinary work, The Physiology of Taste. And in 1908, Swiss entrepreneur Julius Maggi began mass-producing bouillon cubes, which had an umami taste derived from vegetable stock. But Aikida appears to have been the first to isolate the amino acids that produce the umami flavor. Dr. Mosby writes, Akita's main innovation was his discovery that, by stabilizing glutamate using ordinary salt, the resulting product was an inexpensive additive that had the capacity to dramatically improve the flavor of both fresh and processed foods. This sodium salt of glutamic acid is called monosodium glutamate. Akita saw his new development as a way to improve health in Japan by making healthy but bland foods more tasty. The website Food Insight explains that when MSG is eaten, the sodium and glutamate break apart in the saliva, and the free glutamate activates a person's umami taste receptors, creating that especially satisfying and savory flavor. CNN explains, I'm a scientist by training. I think how MSG works is one of the coolest scientific things, says Tia Raines, a Chicago-based nutrition scientist. We have different receptors on our tongue for different tastes. A receptor for umami looks almost like a Venus flytrap under a microscope. She adds, mimicking a C with her hand, glutamate is the amino acid that has the snug fit to that receptor. The discovery was remarkable. The University of Tokyo School of Science writes that on April 24, 1908, Professor Akita applied for a patent for a manufacturing method for seasoning with glutamic acid as the key component. And on July 25th of the same year, his patent registration was accepted. This invention is now ranked as one of the 10 great inventions in Japan. A 2007 edition of the Food and Drug Law Journal notes that the product that emerged from Aikida's laboratory, monosodium glutinate, was quickly patented in Japan, the United States, England, and France. Aikida brought the powdered substance to iodine manufacturer Suzuki Saburo, whose Suzuki Chemical Company began marketing it in 1909 under the brand name Ajinomoto, meaning essence of taste. The journal JSTOR Daily writes, Aikida's invention came at a perfect time. Japan was pushing to compete with the West in technological innovations. The country's educated middle class was excited about the new applications of modern science, including in the kitchen. The Suzuki Chemical Company aimed its product squarely at this market, promoting its Ajinomoto brand MSG as a predictable, convenient, scientifically proven product. By 1939, its use in home kitchens was so common that one prominent Japanese chef said restaurant diners no longer like food without it. The additive then spread to Taiwan, and then China, and then the United States. There is a popular belief that MSG was brought to the U.S. by the military after the Second World War. The story goes that U.S. service members preferred Japanese rations to American rations, owing to the inclusion of MSG. In fact, CNN noted in May of 2023 that the U.S. military even held the first ever MSG symposium after World War II to discuss how the seasoning could be used to make tastier field rations and boost soldiers' morale. The Food and Drug Law Journal explains that after World War II, the U.S. military took an interest in MSG's virtues, since in the words of Colonel John D. Peterman, quartermaster of the Food and Container Institute for the Armed Forces, flavorless rations can undermine morale as quickly as any other single factor in military life. But MSG had come to the U.S. long before that. The culinary website Delicious Living notes that by the mid-1930s, MSG in Ajinomoto made its way to America. But it wasn't introduced to American palates via the expansion of Chinese food restaurants as commonly believed, and it wasn't packaged in the form of table-ready spice as it was in Japan. Nor was it sent in seasoning shakers to be embraced and employed by street vendors as it was in Taiwan. Instead, MSG was shipped to the United States in crates of 10-pound tins of the white powder, where it found an audience with industrial customers, such as the Campbell's Soup Company. The Kansu Company recognized MSG's capacity to make bland food 
taste better. Between the 1930s and 1941, the United States bought more Ajinomoto than any other country outside of Japan and Taiwan. Daystar Daily writes, While MSG never caught on as a home kitchen ingredient in the U.S. the way it did in Japan and China, its role in the industrialized food system here was huge. It was common, for example, to find MSG in frozen and canned foods across the country. This industrial use was combined with the growing interest in the U.S. for Chinese food. J-Star Daily writes that in the United States of the 1930s and 40s, white Americans were beginning to visit Chinese restaurants, where the use of MSG was probably widespread. The Food and Drug Law Journal explains, in the same year that MSG spread through the processed food industry, Chinese restaurants became a ubiquitous part of the American landscape. Thus, regardless of whether or not individual consumers applied bottled MSG to food at home, two other common eating experiences, canned and frozen foods, along with prepared Chinese food, delivered large quantities of the flavor stimulant to American taste receptors. But the U.S. attitude towards food, and particularly food additives, was about to change. Delicious Living explains. Trust in the conventional food system didn't last. America in the 1960s was the birthplace of environmental, health, and product safety movements, with a focused attention around the risk of chemicals in food and pesticides on our land and their potential carcinogenic effects. Americans became leery of any strange-sounding ingredients, and health repercussions of consuming the chemical-sounding MSG was called into question. This skepticism was given particular weight when a letter by a Chinese-American doctor named Robert Ho Man Kwok was published in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine, a science article published on the ABC News website 538 Notes. In 1968, the New England Journal of Medicine published a letter from a doctor complaining about radiating pain in his arms, weakness, and heart palpitations after eating at Chinese restaurants. He mused that cooking wine, MSG, or excessive salt might be to blame. Reader responses poured in with similar complaints, and scientists jumped to research the phenomenon. Chinese restaurant syndrome was born. The History Institute of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania writes, a month later, the NEJM printed 10 responses from other doctors. Like Kwok, the doctors reported discomfort after eating Chinese food, either in themselves or in friends or patients. CNN writes that MSG took the biggest hit, with the effects of the latter rippling on throughout the decades all over the world. Restaurants publicly swore off MSG. Food and beverage publicists begged not to be asked about it. Diners experienced discomfort after a meal, blamed it on MSG. The culinary website Delicious Living writes that as far as many were concerned, Quok's letter to the editor sufficed as research on the topic, and MSG, for whatever reason, stood out as the most likely culprit, thus beginning a several decades-long epidemic of Chinese restaurant syndrome, which was, most commonly, a self-diagnosed condition. 538 writes that early on, researchers reported an association between consuming MSG and the symptoms cited in the New England Journal of Medicine. Inflammatory headlines and book titles followed. Chinese food make you crazy? MSG is number one suspect, wrote the Chicago Tribune. While books titled Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills, and In Bad Taste, The MSG Symptom Complex, prompted FDA reviews and 60 Minutes investigations. But even then, there were reasons to question this narrative. The History Institute of Philadelphia continues. The symptoms cataloged in the letters included fainting, back spasms, sweating, dizziness, flushed skin, and a numb jaw. Puzzlingly, though, no two letter writers listed the same symptoms, and the possible links between them was anyone's guess. They appeared all over the body, came at widely varying times after eating. Stranger still, some doctors declared the syndrome occurred only in certain geographical locations. New York and Southern California were deemed risky, while Hawaii and London were absolved. Nor could the doctors agree on the instigating ingredient. One blamed duck sauce, another frozen veggies. Others fingered mustard, wonton soup, or pufferfish venom. One even blamed the physical strain of Westerners struggling with chopsticks. Of note, one neurologist explicitly absolved MSG, noting that he cooked with it all the time at home and never felt a thing. Still, regulators were concerned. The Food and Drug Law Journal writes, on October 23, 1969, Gene Meyer, chair of the White House Conference on Food, Nutrition, and Health, recommended MSG be banned in baby foods. Meyer based his recommendation on a report earlier in the year by Dr. John Olney, stating that injections of monosodium glutinate had caused brain damage in mice. But despite testimony from Dr. Olney, further animal studies, and anecdotal evidence reported by numerous doctors throughout the 1970s, MSG was never banned or subjected to further regulation. 
like saccharin and many other ambiguous substances in the contemporary world food system, MSG continued to be consumed, even as the controversy about its health effects persisted. But the controversy was lightly settled in the minds of the public. Smithsonian Magazine writes, Few letters have the power to stop conversation in its tracks more than MSG, one of the most infamous additives in the food industry. The three little letters carry so much negative weight that they're often whispered sheepishly, or more often, decidedly preceded by the modifier, no. That seems to make everyone breathe a collective sigh of relief when they go out to eat. Nobody wants MSG in their food, the protest goes. It causes headaches, stomach aches, dizziness, and general malaise. It's unhealthy, and maybe even worse, unsexy, used by lazy chefs as an excuse for flavor, not an enhancement. But the science on the issue is far from settled. Smithsonian continues. Double-blind studies often showed little correlation between MSG and adverse symptoms. The Guardian writes other scientists were testing MSG and finding no evidence of harm. In one 1970 study, 11 humans ate up to 147 grams of the stuff every day for six weeks without any adverse reactions. At the University of Western Sydney, the researchers concluded tersely, Chinese restaurant syndrome is an anecdote applied to a variety of prosperidal illnesses. Rigorous and realistic scientific evidence linking the syndrome to MSG could not be found. Prevention Magazine writes that there is no good research to back up the notion that MSG is bad for you, explains Susan Levine, Director of Nutrition Education at Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. In fact, international organizations such as the World Health Organization, the Food and Drug Administration, and the European Food Safety Association classify MSG as generally recognized as safe, and notes that a 2019 review of the literature concluded that many of the reported negative side effects of MSG are poorly informative. They are based on excessive dosing that does not meet with levels normally consumed in food products. Dr. Mosby notes that the panic seems to have surrounded Chinese restaurants while ignoring the MSG used in many other products. And as the history of this unique medication condition suggests, it was a disease whose spread owed as much to persisting prejudices about Chinese culinary practices and culture as it did to fears of the effects of MSG and other food additives. The Guardian asked more directly, If MSG is so bad for you, why doesn't everyone in Asia have a headache? This concern has caused the medical community to replace the term Chinese restaurant syndrome with MSG symptom complex. Moreover, a wellness newsletter published by the University of Washington School of Medicine explains that MSG is a naturally occurring substance that is safe to eat and found naturally in many foods already. Dr. Raines told CNN, our bodies make glutamate, so it would not be possible to have an allergy to glutamate. The Neuroscience Institute of Stanford University explains that the reality is, MSG and umami give us the same taste experience. While MSG has a negative connotation and umami has a largely positive one, they actually use the same molecule, an amino acid called glutamate, to activate our taste receptors. But many agree that the evidence is at least inconclusive. A 2018 study in the Journal of Experimental and Clinical Sciences argues that further studies need to be undertaken in order to assess the connection between MSG and cardiovascular disorders, headache, and hypertension in human models, and concludes that if more substantive evidence of MSG toxicity would be provided, a total ban on the use of MSG as a flavor enhancer would not be unwise to consider. Even the FDA admits the controversy is Health Essentials, a publication of the Cleveland Clinic notes, because of the ongoing controversy surrounding MSG, the FDA requires MSG to be listed on the labels of processed foods that include it. Smithsonian concludes, Parties on both sides of the debate slung accusations at the other, with the anti-MSG researchers claiming that studies were being funded by MSG producers and pro-MSG researchers accusing the other side of fear-mongering. And the controversy continues. The Food and Drug Law Journal notes of the path that MSG has taken from its discovery to its being widely embraced to being largely vilified to today having its reputation maybe somewhat rehabilitated. Simply put, the lesson is that our taste buds are historically shaped. And MSG is certainly still around. CNN notes that many modern chefs are starting to embrace MSG and try to destigmatize this century old ingredient. And it's in some very popular foods in America, like Chick fil A's chicken sandwich and Kentucky Fried Chicken's extra crispy chicken breast and chips like Doritos and Pringles. So, is MSG safe to eat? Well, I'm a historian not a scientist, but food regulatory agencies throughout the world have determined it to be generally safe for human consumption. Perhaps Food Essentials put it best. They said, if you experience negative symptoms when you eat foods with MSG, you might want to avoid it. 
Most of us, though, can rest easy knowing that MSG is not the toxic ingredient that it was once purported to be. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.